back in the day, there was one company that ruled the arcades. It was Taito! Taito. Today on the Big Retro Show, I'm going to be talking about all the Taito arcade games that everyone should play. We begin with the sequel to one of the best light gun games ever created. What's better than arming yourself with an Uzi and taking on terrorists? That's right, arming yourself with two. Operation Thunderbolt was released to the world in 1988. It was a direct sequel to the excellent Operation Wolf with a notable difference. Operation Wolf had only one Uzi to kill fools with. Operation Thunderbolt had two. That means you could put two quarters in and use two Uzis like Chuck Norris did in Invasion USA or be generous and take on the bad guys with a friend. The gameplay for Operation Thunderbolt resembles that of Operation Wolf, but one noticeable difference are the driving levels in Operation Thunderbolt. You play as badass Green Berets Roy Adams and Hardy Jones, and it's your mission to save American hostages who are on board a hijacked airplane. The hijackers forced the pilot to land in Africa. Big mistake. You arm yourselves with an Uzi or two in your attempt to beat the game's eight levels. Aside from the deadly bullets that your Uzi belches at enemies, you are also armed with rockets, just like in the first game, and you fight a crazy amount of terrorists. The game has several hostages that love to run right in front of your gun. Kill one of them and you lose points. What I love about this game is that it lets you take on enemies with the most vicious weapon of the 1980s. The Uzi was a king back in the day, and this game proves it. Operation Thunderbolt was ported to the SNES and you can buy a copy for $325 complete in box or $118 loose. Ninjas were huge in the 80s and apparently so were 4 player ninja arcade games. Ninja Kids was Taito's answer to this craze and it was an awesome arcade game. The Ninja Kids weren't turtles though, they were puppets, and they were set loose to conquer a clan who was trying to summon Satan and control the world. You play as one of the four Ninja Muppets, each armed with their own custom weapon. It's a novel idea, right? The Blue Ninja uses a fast katana, and the Yellow Ninja wields a chain and sickle. The Red Ninja is armed with Ninja Stars, which are my personal favorite, and the Green Ninja, who resembles a well-known Muppet I might add, uses a three-part staff. Each has its own strengths and reach. The enemies in this game, let's just say, are interesting. You and three of your friends will have a fun time going through the game's five missions and fighting in settings including city streets, an apartment building, a construction site, a ninja infested blimp, and the Satan's base at the dark church within a spooky graveyard. The game is a fun throwback to the days when ninjas ruled, and although it's not quite as fun and entertaining as the other ninja game that ruled the arcades, it's worthy of a playthrough. In keeping with the ninja theme, Taito released the Ninja Warriors in the arcades in 1987. I remember first playing this game at a local Six Flags amusement park. They had an arcade there and I begged my mom to let me skip the ride so I can go and play the Ninja Warriors. The Ninja Warriors is a side-scrolling arcade hack and slash in which you take on the role of a cyborg ninja whose mission it is to overthrow a corrupt president named Bangler. He declares martial law in the nation and controls everything with his military. A group of scientists creates you and it's your job as the android ninja to overthrow the government. You traverse through the levels cutting down scores of army men with your knives and ninja stars. It's great fun! One of the things that drew me to this game is its panoramic view. The other two aspects of the game that drew me in are the graphics and the sound. Both are top notch. The attention to detail that the developers incorporated into the game made it feel more real. The character models they used, especially the soldiers who resemble Carl Weathers, added to the overall enjoyment of the game. The Ninja Warriors was ported over to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and to date, I still prefer the arcade version over the console version. It was just so badass. 
Ninja Warriors on the SNES will cost you $612, complete in box, or $140, loose. Aside from rail shooters and beat-em-ups, Taito was also known for its excellent running guns, and Thunder Fox does not disappoint. Released in the arcades in 1990 and later to the Sega Genesis in 1991, Thunder Fox puts you in the role of one of two warriors who make up Thunder Fox, an anti-terrorist team who is out to save the world. At its core, Thunder Fox is a side-scrolling running gun where you take control of either Thunder or Fox. Those are the names of the two agents. How original, huh? Thunder is better at using firearms, while Fox is better at using his knife. Which comes in handy because the weapons in this game are limited, but pack a punch. Most of the gameplay consists of you stabbing, shooting, and murdering the hell out of your enemies with knives, guns, machine guns, rocket launchers, flamethrowers, and grenades. The game reminds me quite a bit of another great arcade game, Konami's Russian Attack. But Thunder Fox's character sprites are much larger. I like how they use the parallax scrolling effect in this game and the explosions are extremely satisfying. You fight wave after wave of soldiers until you reach the end of the stage and face off against a tank or another boss. At one point during the game you control a hover ship and the gameplay switches from a run and gun to a shoot em up. It's a good way to break up the fighting and keep you interested in the game. Overall this is a fairly decent run and gun that you should play through at least once. You can snag a copy of Thunder Fox for the Sega Genesis for $115 complete in box or $34 loose. Oh my god guys, I totally forgot this game existed. I used to play it all the time in the arcades and wondered what it was called. It was only after I started picking the games for this episode that I was reconnected with Zane Selina, and I'm so glad I did. Zane Selina is a unique hybrid of a run and gun and shoot em up that was a staple of any good arcade experience, at least for me. You play as a galactic bounty hunter who travels from planet to planet murdering all your enemies. But this is for a good reason as they are making life miserable for everyone. The game starts off in run and gun mode and you arm yourself with a laser gun. Certain enemies drop power ups that enhance your weapon, giving it a grenade companion, splitting it into a double shot or a spread gun. Your character can double jump right from the get go, which I thought was pretty awesome. You can also crouch and lay low to the ground to avoid enemy bullets. Each of the game's five planets is divided up into two stages. Each stage begins with a side-scrolling run and gun stage where you take out the bad guys and face a boss at the end of the stage. After blowing up their headquarters, you take to the skies in your spaceship and are now in a shoot 'em up stage where you take on enemies and try to reach the end of the level. Like most of the games in Taito's arcade library, this game has superb graphics and sound. When I first learned that Kadash was an arcade game, I was extremely surprised because I just thought of it as a Sega Genesis game. Boy was I wrong. Kadash is even better in the arcades and is probably the only proper arcade RPG that I know of. Kadash can best be described as an action RPG in which you take control of one of four heroes. You get to choose from a warrior, a ninja, a priestess, and a wizard. The game is supposedly easier to beat with the warrior, but I found that most of the characters were pretty comparable. The game takes place in a fantasy world and it's your mission to take out the demons and their leader, the Balrog, who are terrorizing the land. Kadash reminds me quite a bit of playing Castlevania 2 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. You travel from town to town talking to the townsfolk, buying weapons and potions, and taking on missions given from the NPCs. You then set off into the world in a hack and slash type gameplay as one of the four heroes to complete your mission, which normally consists of traveling somewhere, killing a boss enemy, and taking an item that they drop and giving it to someone so you can move on to the next town. The character sprites in this game are huge and the music and sound complement the game very well. There are no one hit deaths in Kadash, so you are getting your quarters worth. 
The game features a countdown timer and if your time expires you must put another quarter in. You can also buy extra time with the loot you collect from your fallen enemies at the town shops. You can also unlock different treasures sprinkled throughout the game as well as doors by collecting keys from your fallen enemies. The dialogue in Kadash is something that I am not used to seeing in the arcade games and it was a fun and surprising time playing this for this episode. A complete unboxed version of Kadash for the Sega Genesis or the TurboGrafx-16 will cost in between $170 and $180 and $43 and $83 loose. Taito had some great rail shooters and Aqua Jack is one of their best. Released in the arcades in 1990, Aqua Jack was one of the games that was light in story but high on action. Just like any arcade game should be. In Aqua Jack you pilot a hovercraft and it's your job to take out as many enemy vehicles as you can. Aqua Jack's story is told through cutscenes that play after you finish each of the game's 8 stages. It's nothing too involved, you just jump on your hovercraft and kill everything in sight. Gotta love the arcades. Each stage has numerous enemies to kill and at the end of each stage is a boss fight. This is a quarter muncher for sure, but worthy of your time and coins nonetheless. Another great Taito rail shooter was Rambo 3. Unlike in Aqua Jack, this game has plenty of story behind it and follows closely the events of the movie of the same name. The game places you in the role of John Rambo who is tasked with rescuing his beloved commanding officer, Colonel Troutman, who was taken hostage while on a mission in Afghanistan. The game is your typical rail shooter, but this time you play as a badass Rambo. You start out with a gun and some explosive tipped arrows, just like in the movie. As you continue killing the Russians who dare get in your path, you acquire more powerful weapons and power-ups that make your killing more enjoyable. Each stage has an end boss that will take you several lives to take out, but that's the nature of the arcade, isn't it? Overall, Rambo 3 is a solid rail shooter and worthy of your time and quarters. Everyone knows that Taito had some of the best shoot 'em ups, and one of my favorite is Darius Gaiden Silverhawk. Released in the arcades in 1994, Darius Gaiden Silverhawk was a third arcade game released in the Story Darius series. The game plays much like the other two games that preceded it. As the story goes, after all of the fighting on Darius, the planet seems to wither, forcing a massive immigration to the planet Vetus. However, after some time has passed, the Darius refugees begin missing their home planet and decide to return. These plans are thwarted, however, when an evil force began attacking their ports of transit, and it's your job as a Silverhawk pilot to clear them out. Good times. The game is basically a side-scrolling shoot-em-up bullet hell game in which you take control of one of the two remaining Silverhawk spacecrafts left in the fleet. Your Silverhawk ships are armed with missiles, bombs, and a protective shield, which all can be upgraded by various power-ups that are dropped by specially colored enemies. One of the most useful weapons at your disposal is the black hole bomb, which as you guessed it creates a large black hole that swallows your enemies to their doom. At its core, this is a bullet hell side-scrolling shoot-em-up with beautiful graphics and epic sound, much like most of the Taito arcade games. Each stage is punctuated by a boss fight and after defeating the boss you are given the choice of where you want to fight next. This is an interesting concept because it boosts the game's replay value significantly. Darius Gaiden was ported over to the Sega Saturn and a copy goes for roughly $88 complete in box on price chart. The loose price is $47. Let's talk about Rastan. I can't tell you how intimidated I was as a kid playing this game. It was because of the big sounds that would emanate from this cabinet. It's like when you died in this game, everyone in the arcade would hear it and it was embarrassing. And the challenge of this game was so high that you would be dying quite a bit. Another reason why this game was so intimidating to me is that it always had a crowd of people around it. Most of them were older and as a younger gamer, you would want to stay out of the way as much as possible. 
Rastan is a side-scrolling hack and slash in which you play as Rastan the Barbarian. The game is every bit as fun as it looks and you travel through the levels hacking your way through mystical enemies. The sound and music in this game are some of the best I've ever heard coming from an arcade game. Your primary weapon is your sword and you can find upgraded weapons such as a flaming sword or axe that you can use to defeat your enemies. You can also collect a variety of power-ups and treasures throughout your playthrough that assist you. The game also features some platforming elements that aren't too difficult, but add to the game's challenge. Each stage has a boss fight at the end of it, which are difficult, but once you learn their patterns can be easily beaten. The game's life bar is a trip. As your health decreases, your heart starts beating faster, and when you die, Rastan screams and disintegrates. It's so very awesome, and so very terrifying at the same time. Rastan never received a proper port to any home console except for its addition into the Taito Legends game that were released on the Xbox and the PS2. Yes, it was released for the Sega Master System, but that game is garbage. Rastan on Taito Legends cost $23 on the PS2 and $12 on the Xbox, both complete in box. While everyone knows about Rastan, not everyone knows about the third game in the series, which is called Warrior Blade. The reason why I'm skipping to the third game is that the second game in the series, Rastan 2 aka Nastar, is complete garbage. Warrior Blade, however, is an excellent beat-em-up with top-notch graphics and sound. Once again, you play as a wily barbarian Rastan, but this time you take on the bad guys with two friends, Dewey or Sophia. Like in the Ninja Warriors, the arcade cabinet for Warrior Blade features a panoramic view with two screens giving the game a larger than life feel. Warrior Blade is your standard beat em up where you take on wave after wave of enemies and meet a boss at the end. The game's difficulty is very low and this is one of the more forgiving beat em ups you will ever play. In Rastan 3 you are essentially after the various treasures of the land and are willing to murder any creature that gets in your way. What a nice guy you are. The stages and the enemies that populate them are drawn with exquisite detail and I am surprised that Taito didn't make a sequel to this game given the popularity of Golden Axe. I am sort of glad they went with a beat em up game for Rastan 3 because it's a nice way to move the series forward. Rastan 3 did not get any arcade ports, but it would have been right at home in either the Sega Genesis or the Super Nintendo. The last game I'm going to talk about is Chaos Heat. Chaos Heat was released in the arcades in 1998 and was not a game I grew up playing in the arcades, but one I was happy to have discovered. The rise of the survival horror genre with games like Resident Evil inspired games like Chaos Heat, which is essentially a 3D hybrid of a run and gun and beat em up in which you take the role of one of three soldiers who must destroy a dangerous biolab. Most of the action in Chaos Heat is centered around its gunplay but you do get to smack enemies around with a melee attack when called for. The game looks a lot like the 3D games that came out during that era and would have been right at home on the PS1 or the Saturn. As you move through the levels you acquire a variety of weapons that assist you such as bombs and missiles. Each character has a charge attack that does significant damage to your enemies but puts you in a vulnerable situation while charging. As you would expect the boss fights in this game are lengthy and challenging but overall, it's a blast to play and pretty straightforward. While this game did not receive any home console ports, a sequel to this game called Chaos Break was released on the PS1 in the year 2000. Today you can pick up a complete box copy of Chaos Break for $138 or a loose copy for $42. If you enjoyed this episode of The Big Retro Show, please leave a comment and a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.